right, all right. Well, first off, good morning. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a different type of workshop, um, meaning in the sense that if you've looked at my Twitter name, you realize that um, I have a night job as well. I'm a DJ. So I like to incite people to have a good time. So the idea here is for us to be loose, have a good time, not be so uptight. IT people, um, we're learning some great new stuff about uh, Cinder. And if, uh, can I get a show of hands of how many of you either have used Cinder or are using Cinder within your company, organization, personally? All right, so you guys are veterans, so I don't have to start at the bottom with explaining what Cinder is and da 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 all that fun stuff, all right? Um, so first off, my name is Walter Bentley. I am an employee of Rackspace. I am a cloud solution architect. And basically, my job is to build private clouds uh, that are built on OpenStack for our customers. Um, whether it be designing, migration, um, hybrid clouds with our public and our private cloud offering, but pretty much I deal with OpenStack every single day of my life, so yeah. Um, so any of us that deals with OpenStack knows that it comes with a lot of power and a lot of pain at times, um, but that's pretty much my role and what I do. So who am I in more, a little bit more detail? Um, Basically, I've been in IT 17 plus years. I started out as an ASP developer, not the ASPX, but an ASP developer. So that just shows how far back we're going. Um, very quickly realized that I spent a lot of time and invest a lot of my energy in things. And when someone tells me that they decided to buy a product instead of the nice fancy code that I created for them, I realized that development was not for me. So I then transitioned into production support. So pretty much, I spent my entire career supporting applications that other people wrote. Um, and wishing that there was a way that I could give them the infrastructure and the ability to, to do things faster without having to me to do all, all the time the work. So I wish OpenStack existed 10 years ago. That would have been great for me. Um, I probably got a lot more sleep and had a lot less gray hair in my beard, but so be it. Um, so these are just some of the companies I work for throughout my life. Um, nothing too huge, but you know I've been around the block a little bit. So. Um, I found this image online, and I thought this was actually pretty cool, because to me, it actually explains quality of service around Cinder in a really great way. Um, you know, you can have uh, three different kinds of service, <laughs> good, cheap, or fast, but not all at the same time. And if you mix them all up in different ways, you can see that sometimes you end up with the results you want, and then sometimes you don't, right? So, um, so I just thought that this was a good icebreaker to kind of explain some of the power around what OpenStack brings, um, as well as... Uh, some of the power around what you know the quality of service offering is. So everyone here loves good service. No one wants bad service in their life. Um, and the same thing with your cloud consumers. They want to be able to have the best experience possible as well as have options. And that's what quality of service actually brings to the table too. Is it brings you the ability to bring options to your cloud consumers. Um, and that's, that's really what we're all about here as far as if you guys are cloud admins, you want to make sure you give your consumers as many options as possible, OK? So before we get started with the lab, because this is going to be a hands-on lab, um, I'm just going to lay some high-level foundation. Then we're going to jump right in. So uh, these are some of the ground rules. Again, I'm not going to tell you to turn your phone off. But if it rings, it's mine. So, and I've been looking for a new iPhone. so. Those of you who have iPhone 6s, preferably the bigger one, just make sure you leave that so that it rings. Um, requirement, ask questions, all right? Throughout the lab, please ask me questions. There are also other rackers here that can help answer your questions. Um, don't hesitate. Don't try and, and, and uh, beat your head against the wall trying to figure it out on your own, all right? Um, and if you obviously have to have a conversation about something, because we all are. What type of phone you have? What, what kind of phone you have? Oh, all right. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I, I gave up uh, IBMs a long time ago. Um, <laughs> uh, if you have to have a conversation, we're all IT professionals. We all have jobs in it, uh, to do. Just please uh, take it outside if you don't mind. Um, as I mentioned before, um, I was going to do groups of five, but um, I broke it down to groups of two. So any of you who do have lab sheets that are willing to take another person into your group, uh, look, you read my mind. Raise your hand. Folks, relocate. Take a moment to relocate. Trust me, I'm not going to get into anything good yet. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to just be two. It can be groups of bigger than two, right, if anyone else wants to participate. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, the materials that we're going to review is actually at this link here. Don't worry about it. It's going to be on the next slide again in a much bigger um, font size, so you can write it down there as well. So again, what I did is I gave out uh, cards that basically have information on it. Take note of your student ID. Take note of your tenant name. You're going to need to know that information. Make sure you get connected into the remote environment. So basically what you're connecting into is a fully functioning OpenStack cloud that's built actually on Rackspace's public cloud. So I'm actually doing quadruple O right now uh, with this environment. And believe it or not, it actually works. So um, it consists of a deployment node, a controller node, a sender node, and four compute nodes. All right. Um, with this, and I'm actually doing two back-to-back -back labs, so it's this lab and then this one right after. So the compute node's not so much you care about, but um, the sender node is really what we're going to focus on today. And again, we will be working with the, the Python CLI. So if you like Horizon, you got to get that out your head. Any cloud, true cloud administrator uses a CLI. Just saying. Um, <laughs> And uh, just to keep in mind, uh, you know, no funny business while you're in the cloud. Of course, I know you guys are going to try and hack it and take it apart, and that's fine. It will be destroyed once the lab is over, so good luck uh, once uh, you walk out the door. But uh, <laughs> just figure out what put it out there. It's not going to be a persistent environment, so it is going to go away. All right. So you guys kind of ready? Sort of ready? Really ready? All right. So um, the lab overview, these are just really quick bullet points that we're going to go through. And after sitting through all the presentations I've been doing since I've been at the summit, I hate bullet points at this point. So I'm sorry. You have to endure bullet points a little bit more. But we're going to configure multiple backends of a sender node. Uh, we're going to create some new volume types. We're going to create and associate a, qu a quality of service definition for those volume types. We're going to add a volume to an instance, and then we're going to connect to that instance, and we're going to do a quick I.O. throughput check, right? And again, this lab is intended to just give you one idea of how you can do this. There are many ways of doing it in OpenStack, um, and that's the power and the pain of it. Um, so this was just intended to give you one idea and one approach. Um, more than willing to hear feedback from you guys if you have some other ways you guys have tried that you've been more successful in as well. All right. so. Now that you've connected to your environment, I need you to go to this link in your browser. This link is actually going to give you all the instructions you would need to do the lab. Um, and it's basically going to take you to GitHub. Um, and within that GitHub repo, there are also some other interesting things in there. There's actually a white paper that explains this uh, quality of service as well. So something you can actually print out and you know, reference later if you wanted to. Um, this whole uh, presentation is actually in there in a PowerPoint as well. So if you miss anything or if you want some of the info, you don't necessarily have to take the pictures with your phone, even though I, I love to see it because I like being in pictures. But the information is all there as well, um, and as well as the lab. It will be there. So let me know. I'm going to give you a few seconds here to make sure you get it pulled up, connect into your environment so that uh, we can uh, get rolling, OK? What's that, sir? Yep. So yeah. So that's a good. Thank you for for reminding me about that. So part of the lab is is you're going to deal with your tenant and as well as you'll deal with uh, one of your neighbors. So it doesn't matter. We're, we're basically student zero one to zero fifteen. I mean zero one to fifteen. So you can pick any one of those uh, within there. Um, it doesn't have to be your neighbor. Uh, but in the instructions, when I say an other tenant, meaning some other tenant other than yours. So again, the, student, the, the tenant names are student 01 all the way up to student 15. So you can pick anyone in, in that spectrum. It doesn't really matter. OK. So everybody connected to the lab environment? All right. Everybody got the instructions up? All right. OK, so um, at this point, we're going to step through the lab. Um, basically going to give everybody three minutes to complete the lab. Is that all right? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 30 minutes. Uh, just messing with you. Come on, I know you guys can do it in three minutes. 
So we're gonna, I'm going to give you about 30 minutes to step through the lab. I'm going to actually step through it myself and kind of speak, speak through it so that that way if you get hung up on something, hopefully I'll be able to articu clearly articulate uh, what I, meant, uh, I wanted you guys to do. And then uh, truthfully being saying, whoever finishes the lab first does get a prize. Not to saying this is the competition. Uh, quality is not always rushed, but just saying if you want a prize, you got to finish first. <laughs> All right? Huh? Don't worry about that, man. You can't, you, can't, you, you, know, you can't focus on that part of it, man. Just know it's Rackspace swag. It's not an a, a, a Apple watch or a, an iPad or anything, all right? So don't, uh, don't expect anything too, too fancy, all right? All right, so I'm going to switch over here and uh, walk through the instructions just like you guys would. Now, my screen is probably extremely small, so let me see if I can make that a little bit bigger. Is that quasi-readable? No, oh, that just got worse. Yeah. Sorry, this is always the dynamic of being on, on stage, and the screen is never big enough to see. No, you don't have to edit an OpenRC file. The lab instructions are exactly as such. You just basically will follow them, and you should be good to go. So at the very beginning of the lab, the first thing we're doing is, is we're connecting into a container. I tell you, I'm going to be collecting some phones, man. <laughs> They're not even paying attention to me. That's fine. Yes. So you're not able to connect to the 172, 29, 236, 255? Now, uh, let me come around and see what. So you connected to the environment first? All right, let me come over. I'll come over. You check. All right, thanks. They have to connect into the, the deployment node first gotcha. before getting to that. Yeah, yeah, it should be. Hopefully, he has the uh, information. What's that? We don't know other groups than a name. You can pick one. So pick student, student 05. Student 05. It can be anyone. All right, so who used student 01 as to create the T name or create the original one? Yeah, I guess I created a, a bit of a disastrous moment. So let me, uh, I'll reset that. I'll take away the, the, the volume type, all right, for student 01. And whoever did, the, whoever did it wrong has to do it with their student ID, and then you guys can do what you need to do, all right?
The other group can be any other group in the room as long as it's not your student ID. So it can be student 02, student 15, student 10, doesn't matter. Just pick another student ID. Because I want to be able to show you the fact that you can't, do with, what's, you can't deal with someone else's uh, volume type. Yes. Yes. Correct. It's just showing you that there's nothing there. Yep. Some of you guys are really moving fast, huh? You got things to do today, huh? <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah, truth be told, the student ID really doesn't matter. It's just, it's just a way of keeping you guys from recreating each other's stuff, but that's happening anyway, so. <laughs> that was really what it was meant to do, but it doesn't really matter. You can call it Bob if you wanted to. Um, he said reading is hard. It can be. So I can see somebody in the audience, when they created their QoS spec, they did not give it a student ID in front of it. So they're going to have problems later in the lab. Yeah. No worries. I mean, I'm just letting you know so that way later on you, you may have to adjust some of the commands, right, to match that. That's all. It's all good. So the thing about dealing with a lot of things in OpenStack is that it doesn't like the names. So it, everything in OpenStack, even though you give it a name, really behind the scenes it creates this funky ID. And it really wants you to use those IDs for most of the things. So that's, that's the idea is you can't really use the name when referencing it. They want the IDs. So the idea is, is that when you logged into your tenant, you're logged in as an admin. So I basically back you out of that, and then I want you, when you source that next file, that this, the OpenRC dash your, your tenant name, it actually you're not you're logging in as a user at that point. So it's I'm basically bringing down your your credentials so that you can do things that a normal user would do, not as an admin. So that's really the only reason. 
Again, you could do it as an admin. It wouldn't make a difference. Just. Oh, you never did anything else, admin? We're not limiting a tenant. What we're doing is we're creating a volume type that has a certain limit to it. Um, and based off of that limit, you're ba based off of that meta that you associate with it, you can tell a person, hey, when you spin up an instance, choose that volume type, and you'll get this type of uh, uh, drive, right, and this type of performance. But you're limiting what that performance is so that everybody doesn't spin up and just totally crash your environment. So you're really adding limits to the volume type is what you're really doing. Right, but you're not you're not keeping people you're not separ segregating yourself. As long as Cinder can connect to that as a back end. Not necessarily. As long as Cinder can connect to that back end, right? You can create volume types to that back end, and Cinder will manage all the stuff behind the scenes of that. So I guess with Ceph, you would carve out just a big block, and you would let Cinder manage it. And Cinder, when you create volume, Cinder will manage that, that big block. And based off of the volume types, you can point it to different Ceph, Ceph clusters or different types of back drives that are in your Ceph clusters. It all depends, right? So just giving you different paths. Yep, and, that, and, and that's easy to do because basically when you go to create the volume, you tell it what type of volume type. So you, 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 distinct, you distinctly say, vi yes, yes, you're creating a volume type that you associate the volumes to. That's the key. Yep. What is the back end? Like what, 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 is, what's, what it's running? Yep, so this is actually an open stack. So what this is, is this is an RPC install. So this is a Rackspace private cloud that's running in our public cloud. So if you go to StackForge, OS Ansible, um, uh, basically the way we build our private clouds is up there, and that's what I use to build this. And if you pay me enough, I'll give you the exact instructions how to stand up RPC in a public cloud. <laughs> Everybody okay? Questions, questions. Everybody's progressing? All right, nobody's yelling at me yet, so I guess that's a good thing. Well, see, the thing is, is that the utility container gives you access to all the OpenStack APIs. Um, now, even though you can do it directly from the deployment node, it's, it's really, it, the reason why we created that container is so that you can, as a cloud admin, can log in there and not really affect any, you're not in a container that has is running an OpenStack service. So you, you feel a little bit less stressed that if somebody whacks up something in that container, they're not gonna mess up Nova or Cinder or Horizon or anything. But you could technically, from the right from the deployment node connect to everything. Um, but I, I, I'm kind of educating a little bit about our private cloud, how we do things, because we deploy our, our services inside of containers, which is kind of a unique thing. So I'm just kind of showing some of that stuff off a little bit, yeah.
you have questions, questions. Yes. Do Nova List and look for the name of uh, the instance you created. Should be your student number underscore my first instance or something of that nature. What's your student number? I'll take a look. Yeah, you don't have an instance created yet. It was successful? Oh, there you are. Sorry, I'm lying to you. So your IP is there. It's on the screen. 10.1.100.7. No problem. Yeah, if you, do, if you source OpenRC while you're in Neutron, you'll actually be able to do Nova List. You should not need a password if you're on the deployment node connecting to it. So make sure you're on the deployment node and then you're trying to SSH into that container. What's that? Yes, just a deployment node. Yes. Yeah, it shouldn't. Let me see. Some reason, your uh, yeah. yeah, no, no, you did everything right. It just for some reason, the authorized key didn't come into your local profile on that server, so. No, because you're right now, you jumped into a c container, right? So you're in a virtual environment. When you get done, you're going to exit, and you're going to jump right back down to where you were. Yes. No, it was actually added in Icehouse, QoS. Well, it, when they first introduced it, it volume types came kind of after or in between at the same time. So it wasn't until now that they're all like, matured and working together, but it was released back in Ice House. Mm -hmm. As long as it can be a back end to sender, all of this applies. That's, that's the key. It has to have, be a back end to sender. Uh, well, it's up to you if you want to do it both, right? But you really don't need to do both. Um, you don't need QoS really twice, right? So if you want to do it with the SAN, that's cool. If you want to do it through, through OpenStack, you can, and you can just let the SAN, just let it be open and let OpenStack control how much bandwidth a person gets or how much a person can use of it. So I would, I would actually, personally, I would let OpenStack do it because it's easier and that's something you can kind of give to a consumer. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, I understand what you mean. Yeah, no, you still have to step through the same way you would do a normal shared storage. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, so the way that um, Cinder works is it talks to its back ends using iSCSI. So no matter what shared storage you're using, whether it's connected to FC or it's an NFS, it doesn't really matter. From a Cinder's perspective, it connects to its back ends over iSCSI. So it's sometimes that causes heartburn, right? Because people think, oh, well, I'm, I have a really fast shared storage, but now I have to deal with iSCSI. But the reality is, is that it's, it's all, all, all over the network, right? And it's relatively, you don't see the difference in, in performance um, as much as you would imagine you would. But it is what it is. There's no way of getting around it. You have to deal with iSCSI if you're going to deal with Cinder and Cinder volumes. You did something wrong. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no valid host found. All right, so anyone who is an OpenStack professional can tell me what that error message means. 
No, it's, it's something with the scheduler, meaning probably I'm out of resources, probably what it means. <laughs> but let me go and take a look. <laughs> I'm not out of resources yet. Yeah, but that's, you guys are just booting a normal machine, so it shouldn't really care where it puts it. Alright, so why are you guys are not telling me what's going on? No, so just add dash L space root if you're having a problem connecting in. Right. So I see that multiple people are starting to fail now. Yeah. No, it's, it should be, I, I, I believe it's something to do with the fact that I'm running on a virtualized environment, so I have to find out, because I should be able to spin up an instance still, it sh I have plenty of resources left. That's what I'm going to try right now, you read my mind. Well, you know what, I'll do it this way. No, there's no router. It's just a, a VXLAN. Ha, okay. We do have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. So you connected into the, the Neutron container, and you looked up the, 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 Q, the QHCP, and you connected to it to that? It didn't do anything? Oh, it times out. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to think that something is... Uh, falling down in the cloud, so give me a second. I ran out of memory. Uh, to 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 yeah, we don't, we don't as a practice do overcommit on memory. <laughs> <laughs> Host has more disks than the expected. They're not that. They're not that huge. 
but I may have to uh, expand that a little bit. All right, so let me ask this question. Who has completed the lab? All right, so let's do it this way. Let's get some people completed, and then that way I can get rid of that stuff. <laughs> and, uh, Actually, it was running, but now I see it. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, it was running. We couldn't SSH it. Like, exact ID, the thing. Okay. Okay. You're all at the last step? Okay. Yep. you know this works but it doesn't work because you guys are here <laughs> <laughs> let me come around this way that way I don't have to reach over this gentleman just trying to see what you guys are seeing screen right now. should have connected immediately. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah. So clearly my cloud can't withstand 15 people or 30 people connected to it trying to connect into the Neutron agent. Uh, so I know everybody. Yeah, no low tests. Yeah. Um, so I apologize for that. If you cannot get into that instance, then uh, you have to take my word on it that it, it does work. Um, yeah, right, literally. Sorry about that, yeah. Uh, so anybody having problems connecting to the instance, everybody is. Um, in a normal world, in your cloud, if you go and try it, it does work. Um, you're connecting to the namespace. Um, apparently, it's not working right now. Sorry. Of course, it worked 15 minutes ago when I tested it all, but such is life. Um, anybody else hung any other place in the lab right now? Other than the mismatch, so tell me a little bit more about what my, my mismatch on my back end name. Okay.
so somewhere else in this instructions, I give a different backend name, huh? So those backends don't exist in the student environment. But that's a sender thing. That that's defined on the sender node. It's not actually in the Yeah. That's interesting because It's right. Because that's the name it wants to use. It's not the name that you define it as, but the volume backend name. So they're there. That, so that command is a valid command, and it should work. This is what it wants to use when you create that, that, that meta tag or that you're setting that, that filter. Not that name, not the name of here. This is sender.conf. It's in the sender container that's on the sender node, of which you don't know where that is. <laughs> yeah, so that's another thing about having everything in containers is you can kind of keep folks away from your environment so they don't tear it up. <laughs> All right, one person got it. I don't know how, by the grace of God, but uh, I'm sure with the help of, of uh, Matt there, you guys got through it. Um, so anyone else, I guess, finished other than the last step of actually checking the, um, what's your student number? It's 10 to 10. All right, so we have to try and figure out who finished first. So who thinks they finished first? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. Um, well, the good news is, is I have a lot of gifts, so uh, everybody's going to get something if you didn't leave already. See, that's what happens when you leave early. You got to ask. See, that's what happens. That's what happens when you leave early. I know it didn't exactly work out, but you don't got to leave early on me. Um, so I'm going to try and spin some instances down just to kind of give some other folks a chance to actually... All right, so give me some student numbers of folks who are, who are done with their lab. 13? 10, 13, thank you. Thank you. Nine, thank you. Three, thank you. So there should be some more room left on the environment now. 
So 10, right? 10, 14, you guys are done. 13, I thought. Yeah? Does everybody agree with that? <laughs> okay. I don't know why it didn't let me delete them the first time, but... Everybody okay? Okay. Okay. I like to hear that. That makes me happy. At least you can see it does work. Just not for everybody. <laughs> At least I'm able to prove you that. <laughs> yeah. You make sure when you, you call them my uh, support about that, you tell them Walter said you can have that. <laughs> They'll totally do that for you. All right. Sorry about all the complications, guys. Yes, it definitely happens when it comes to OpenStack. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm kind of the guy that customers come to when they want to really specialize their cloud or do things that are not normal out of the box stuff, such as doing this QoS or doing multi-tenant isolation, which is the lab right after this one. Um, uh, setting up availability zones, doing multi-region across data centers. Um, you know, really, I, I I've you know part of my job is to sit down with the customer for two three days and literally design their private cloud for them and I give them back a, a, a document that actually says okay this is what your private cloud will look like these are all the details tenants uh, AZs uh, users how we're going to set up the partitions on the servers I mean it goes down to the bare metal detail yes yes You can change it in a Horizon dashboard, or you can rerun it through the CLI to make a change to it. Um, those sets can be adjusted. You just have to reset it again, um, and it'll just it'll just reset. But yeah, you no, no, because it's it's at the time it's at the time that you create the volume is when it it pulls in those those variables, right? So, um, and that QoS, as long as that volume type is associated with that QoS that you made the change to, then it it will apply to everything. Right, going forward. But that's this is where you have to get down to granularity, right? If you're going to use different volume types for different people, you you, you got when you have different tenants and you have different purposes, you have to create different volume types for them. Because you can't really share them because when you make that QoS change, it changes it for everything that's associated with it. Um, and we'll go. I'll actually go in more into that in my next lab after this one, talking about when you're doing multi-tenant isolation, you kind of have to do redundant work to really accomplish it, but it is what it is for now. All right. Are folks progressing? Yes, a little bit. Yeah, so the last step of, connect, of connecting to that instance through the neutron agent, it may or may not connect. I'll say it that way. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to allow you to ask me some questions, and I'm going to give you some marketing splash, and then, yeah, that's it.